Happy Thursday, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Bread Drive Through. Can you believe that we've made it past 40 episodes at this point? Um, wow, what a journey. I was even just sharing with my daughter, wow, do you remember in the beginning how nervous we were and the pressure I felt talking into a camera and everyone's adjusting to this whole new normal, but now we're in it. We're in the middle of it. And remember, from the beginning, the conviction was um, Bible saturation over Corona media inundation. You know, we want to be saturated with the word of God, you know, over, you know, being saturated with the spirit of fear, which the world is putting out. Um, and now look at how much we are in the middle of right now uh, with uh, the killing of George Floyd and the rioting. And, and wow, you know, actually just talking with one of our officers this morning and just please keep, you know, officers in prayer, of course, keep all men in prayer, you know, we're commanded to, but especially, you know, our African-American um, brothers and sisters in blue. Um, one of them just shared, just, just having a very tough time putting the uniform on, still believing they're called, you know, to serve and to protect, but uh, just the confliction uh, that they're feeling, you know. Um, so anyway, let's just keep them in prayer. So much to be praying about. And I just want to share with you guys, you know, what I would recommend in all of these times because uh, there's a charge in the air, right? Everyone is feeling a charge. These are, these are charged times. Please just take some time and just sit in the Word of God. Uh, that's what I'll be doing, you know, after the Daily Bread drive through Just sit in the Word and just let the Lord speak to you uh, and give you a word. And then after, you know, you're done reading, you know, then just say, Lord, speak to me. You know what I mean? Let's just settle your heart. But let's let this also uh, be the primer and that as well. You know, that's why you're tuning in. This is what the Word of God is doing, you know. Uh, by the way, a lot of Antioch folk, just some new faces have been reaching out. Uh, when I give my cell phone number, it's for you guys to use it. So uh, I got a call at 1030 the other night. Someone just wanted to get deep into some counseling and last night. And just please, that's that's what I'm here for. All right. I love you guys. All right. So look, what we got? We're five minutes in. All right. Let's keep going. Today, we're going to wrap up heaven. Um, my daughter said heaven part seven. I would do heaven part seven because... Even me, I don't, I don't know it well enough. I don't celebrate it enough. I'm not studying it enough. This is the eternal abode for the believer. The Bible says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. First Corinthians 2, 9. So while I've seen some of the most beautiful beaches on planet earth, right? Some of them, right? The Bible saying, I has not seen. That means what I saw there, what I experienced there, I still have not seen, nor can I even imagine what God's prepared for them that love him. So this is our place. Jesus said in John 14, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Actually, I need to just clear something up just to make clear. He, the, the Greek for mansions is rooms, and it's speaking of when the bridegroom would give the dowry for the bride, which would be the, the down payment. For us, it's actually the engagement ring is the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians 1, 13, 2 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23. The bridegroom would then go back to the father's house and build an extension onto the father's house. So when he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions, what he's really saying in the Greek is, in my father's house, John 14, there are many rooms. Heaven, the new Jerusalem, think of it as one roof, this new city, this new Jerusalem, but it's many rooms. But we can't even imagine or wrap our mind around it because we think of everything in three dimensions. But basically, that is just a small box of at least 10 plus dimensions of what uh, everything consists of. You know, even physicists today can infer seven other dimensions, you know, just from formulae. So we can't even imagine what it's like to step out of these three dimensions. We can't even imagine what it was like before the fall. We kind of see it as just beautiful rainforest everywhere and not a bad day in sight, you know. We can't even imagine what Adam and Eve experienced before the fall, clothed in light, experiencing even possibly more than uh, three dimensions, you know, anyway. How many more colors are really on the spectrum? You know, what is light? You know, anyway, let's let's dive in. So Revelation 21 comes in and it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. You have to write down 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, because the two words, and again, when we're talking Greek, when we're talking the Hebrew, when we're looking up words in blueletterbible.org, uh, blue you got to be using the King James. I would recommend, if you're going to study the Bible with a microscope, if you want to get into every word, I would recommend the King James because it's linked to the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance System where you could look it up on blueletterbible.org and get the meaning. My point, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, it says that the, when the Lord returns, that after the millennial reign, Revelation 20, 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 11 says... All of the heavens and the earth are going to melt away with a fervent heat and a great noise. And it says that everything will be dissolved, right? Second Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 11. Dissolved in the Greek means loosed. It's the same Greek word used in Mark 11, verse 2, when Jesus says, Go over yonder and loose that colt that no man has ever sat on so that I can ride on it. Same word for loose. The Lord will be releasing his grip on all of he is the nuclear force holding every atom together and all he will do is loose it so when this happens revelation 21 verse 1 i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away for some 404 verses in the book of revelation there's over 800 old testament references that's why the more you understand your old testament is the better you will be able to unpack the book of revelation Mind you, in Revelation 21, verse 1, when he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Isaiah prophesied of that. That means Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be God, Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah prophesied that he would be born in poverty, Isaiah 53, that he'd be crucified between two thieves, Isaiah 53, that he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53. But he also prophesied, look at Isaiah's ministry, that God would create the Hebrew word bara, speak the word from nothing and create a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah's ministry out of this world. So I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. You know, sea divides, right? You ever stand on, you know, even the beach of, of a remote island and you just realize like the mainland or the United States is so far away. The sea speaks of division, right? Um, basically saying there'll be no more division, no more sea, nothing that divides, and I, John, verse 2, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So here we are. Here's the throne of God, immovable, never moves right? Eternal, the throne of God. Paul called that the third heavens, 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Here we are with him, and it says in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, to him that overcometh, I will grant the seat on my father's throne with me. Can you imagine we're on, ah, we're, how, how? Eye is not seen, ear is not heard. The human heart can't imagine. We're on the throne with the Lord. The heavens, the Shamayim, the universe and the earth burns up because he just releases his grip on it. We get to watch all of that. Then he just speaks the word, Psalm 33, verse 9. He spoke and it was. We get to watch him create all over again a new heaven and a new earth. And then he creates a capital city for this rejoicing universe without the presence of sin. There's not one iota of sin, not one negative thought, no devil, not one, one little push of temptation nothing all glory and beauty and then here comes the new jerusalem coming down and it's the capital city of a rejoicing universe and the angels and read revelation 4 again about the spontaneous worship of heaven here it comes down verse 4 and god will wipe away all tears from their eyes making clear there's no sorrow here intimacy god it doesn't say an angel will wipe away every tear even that would be amazing grace God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying. Neither will there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Please listen to yesterday's message. We really unpacked two verses in Isaiah and looked here to look at what will we remember in heaven and what won't we remember in heaven. 
Will we, will we remember bad experiences in heaven? Will we remember our bad earthly experiences? You need to listen to yesterday's teaching. You need to listen to all the teachings because it's God's word, right? And it's just God's word. Verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, verse 6, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirsty, a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. The idea is undeservedly. He that overcomes will inherit all things. All of this is ours, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We all once had our part. This once That was once our character assessment. And even though we are still sinners because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our new character assessment is spotless. Our new character assessment is the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And anytime you even read something like that, you should be able to celebrate, that was me, but because of what Christ did, the Father does not see me as that anymore. He sees me as light. He sees me as a son or daughter of the Most High God. He sees me as spotless in his sight. As far as the east is from the west, some Psalms 103, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. You know, you can't only go north for a little while before you're going south. You can only go south for a little while before you're going north. But you can go east forever. You can go west forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. He's put an infinite distance between us and our sin. Hallelujah. And verse 9, there came unto me one of the seven angels that had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me and said, come hither, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, verse 10, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Verse 12, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates were 12 angels, names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So verse 12, let me draw your attention. It says here that on the gates were the names of the children of Israel. To study this life, style, and the sin of the 12 sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel, and to see God's grace that his name, their names are on the gates. It says in Hebrews that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. Look at, look at what characterized our lives before Christ. Look at our wicked hearts. Look at how holy and beautiful and pure the Lord is. And in the work of the gospel, it says he's not ashamed to call us brethren. The Lord is pleased to have their names in the gates. Reuben, who slept with his own father's concubine, who Jacob said, you will never excel in life. You are unstable as water. Reuben's name is on the gate. Can you just imagine as you walk in, all of us as trophies of grace, and you just enter in through the gate and you see Reuben's name fully grasping the holiness of God? Amazing. Then when it goes to the foundations of the city, verse 14. So you want a picture, here's the city and it's a cube, which we're gonna be told, right? Here are 12 gates, three on each wall. And then there's 12 foundations. And in the names of the foundations, it says here, are the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. Here's a great question. There were 12 disciples, right? Judas hung himself, right? It says here that on the 12 foundations are the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Whose name is the 12th one? Is it Matthias? Remember Acts chapter 1, Peter stands up in the upper room and says, we must fulfill the scripture and find a replacement for Judas who hung himself. So they prayed and cast lots and the lot fell on Matthias. Is it Matthias or is it the apostle Paul? Well, interesting, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I'm one who was born out of due time. In the Greek, it means I'm, I'm the premature stillborn. That's what he's really saying. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. 
Some will say, well, Matthias is never mentioned throughout the book of Acts, so maybe God didn't honor their decision to pick Matthias as the 12th disciple. Well, Thomas's name isn't mentioned in the book of Acts either, but clearly he is one of the 12. Personally, personally, I don't know. I, I believe that Matthias's name will be there. I don't know, but isn't that what makes this so exciting? But whatever is there, it'll be right. And it will be just a doxology of praise to God's grace. And believe me, Paul will not be complaining at all as he finished his course, fought a good fight, and kept the faith, right? And it says, verse 15, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city. A reed speaks of ownership, but even the measuring tape is gold. Look at that. It says he had a golden reed. They would use a reed in ancient times as a measuring stick, almost like a meter stick. Even the measuring tape in heaven is gold. Even the measuring tape in heaven is gold. All right, hold on. Let me keep going. Hmm. Verse 16, and the city lies four square. So here's this city coming down. And if you want a picture, can I say a Rubik's cube? It is a cube, a cube coming down. Not a three-dimensional city of some, you know, utopia coming down on a cloud. It is a cube outside of three dimensions as we can fathom it, right? It says the city lies four square. The length is as large as the breadth is as large as the height, right? And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. Well, you see, if you have your Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, you could look up every measurement every everything you look up a furlong it'll tell you that a furlong is about one eighth of a mile so what do i do it says it's twelve thousand furlongs if one furlong is one eighth of a mile twelve thousand furlongs is one thousand five hundred miles but it's a cube so each side is square miles each side of this cube is one thousand five hundred square miles right if you want to know, I'm sorry, 1,500 miles, if you want to know how many square miles, uh, let's go to geometry class. Picture your cube, okay? Length times width times height. If we just want to know what one side is, it would be length times width. So it would be 1,500 times 1,500. That gives you 2,250,000 square miles. One Each side of this cube is 2,250,000. 250,000 square miles. Now, here's the thing. Somebody at this point like, oh, this is overwhelming me. No, apps on phones overwhelm me. Numbers in heaven, when I can calculate what eyes not seen, what ears not heard, this doesn't overwhelm me. One and two, if God put it here, he wants us to know it. If he is telling you here the measurements, God is revealing to us the measurements of the heavenly city of our eternal abode. So again, we have to, when it says it's a cube, it's 12, it's, it's 12,000 furlongs, right? One furlong is one eighth of a mile. 12,000 furlongs would equal 1,500 miles. If we want to know what a surface is, we have to multiply the length times the width. That's 1,500 times 1,500. That is 2,250,000 square miles. If we now want to know, say it's a cube and like a fish tank, we want to fill it with water. We don't want to know the area of a side anymore. Oh, uh, geometry class, how you doing? We don't want to know the uh, a side anymore. We want to know how much water can the tank hold? What's the volume? Now we're moving to not just length times width, which is 1,500 times 1,500, but length times width times height. 1,500 times 1,500 times the height now, 1,500. If you do that, you end up with 3,375,000,000 cubical miles. Now, this is why this gets so important. So we say, can we all fit? Annie, are they, are they, hand, are they rocking with this? Can we all fit? Here's the question. Can every redeemed person from Adam and Abel all the way down to here, all the way to those who will be saved during the tribulation, all the way to those who will be saved and born during the millennial reign, can we all fit? All right, here we go. Here's your cube. I think some of you in your mind are still picturing like this, this glorious smaller thing coming down from heaven that John sees. Length times width times height, 12,000 furlongs. Let me just give you an idea of what the sides are. If they're 1,500 miles wide, each side 1,500 miles um, long, that is the distance from Colorado to Atlantic City, 
okay? That is the distance from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. One side of this cube is Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic City to Colorado, one side. This side, same thing. 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 Do you see what is coming down from heaven now? Are you wrapping your mind around? This is continental what is coming down. And the inside of it is 3,375,000,375,000,000 cubicle miles. Can we all fit in there? And obviously it's not just three dimensions. So it's not just a matter of, you know, being on the bottom of the tank, if you will. You want to get this book. Dr. Henry Morris, one, he wrote a book called The Genesis Record, but he also this gets into how Genesis 1-2 talks about when the Holy Spirit is moving in Genesis 1-2. It's energizing in the Hebrew, and that's where we get gravitational force, electromagnetic force. He gets into calculating how many animals could fit on the ark and really breaks down how the animals of the kingdom could easily fit into the ark's measurements. That's The Genesis Record. He wrote another book called The Revelation Record. Get The Revelation Record because this scientist is the one that breaks all of this down that I'm rehearsing to you now. And the question is, can we all fit? Can we all fit in there? Here's what he concludes. He says that roughly from Adam in roughly 4004 BC, that's what historian Usher, the best known calculation of when Adam was created was 4004 BC. From Adam to the flood, how many humans probably lived? From the flood to the present day, how many humans probably lived? And then during the millennial reign, he being generous, he says just to be generous, around 800 to 100 billion humans will have lived from Adam all the way down to after the millennial reign. Somewhere between 800 to one, wait, 800 to 100 billion, wait a minute. 800 to 100 billion. I don't like that number. Um, 800 million to 100 billion. 800 million to 100 billion, right? You need to get the book and check it out for yourself. He's saying if you have this many people, how many get saved? Jesus said broad is the way that leads to destruction and many be that find it. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Even the parable of the sower, we see one in four hearts having good soil. He says, let's just say that one in four get saved. If just one in four people got saved, and this is being generous, he's saying that you would have 20 billion saved folk from Adam all the way to the end of the age. The question is, 20 billion people, can 20 billion people live forever? And can we fit into this cube that is 3,375,000,000 cubical miles. Basically, he does the calculations. Remember, one side alone is Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic City to Colorado, that now make that a cube. Each side is that size. Basically, for 20 billion people to abide in there, the calculation he does, you need to get the book, The Genesis, The Revelation Record by Dr. Henry Morris. His conclusion is every one of us, if 20 billion, and that's being... That's even throwing in extra people. That's erring on the side of exaggeration. 20 billion are there. Each person would have their own cube, which would be 75 acres on a side. Each would have their own cube with 75 acres on the side. And he's saying that still allows for recreation, for parks, for whatever kind of glorious reserve, rainforest, that still even allows for common places beyond the size that we can even imagine. Now do you see more of what Jesus is saying when he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. In the Greek, it means there are many rooms. All right, we have a few minutes left. Um, let's keep reading. He measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. If you have your Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, you can actually look up each of the different stones. Um, let's move along to verse 21. The 12 gates had 12 pearls. I think of the parable of the pearl of great price. And isn't it interesting? A pearl grows in an oyster when sand gets inside where the creature is. 
it creates an irritant so the creature begins to secrete something around the irritant so it no longer is the irritant and that forms a pearl a pearl is birthed out of an irritant it's lemons being turned into lemonade look at how the very gates were made of pearl and then even a oyster is an unclean animal to the jewish person based on leviticus 11 it's non-kosher that even speaks of just the gentiles of us we are the pearl of great price the pearl represents gentiles being sought after as the church is made of course of jew and gentile galatians 3 28 but it's just so beautiful to see that even the gates are made of pearl so when you hear people saying streets made of gold and pearly gates that is from the bible whatever else they do with heaven that we can only go to scripture but pearly gates is actually right here verse 21 the 12 gates were 12 pearls every gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold and he's saying it's like transparent glass we can't even imagine what pure gold looks like i mean the metal that even metal we look at that's just 99 percent pure we cannot imagine pure gold he's saying it is pure gold like transparent glass he says in verse 21 verse 22 and i saw no temple therein for the lord god almighty and the lamb or the temple there was no temple needed to hold god's glory because god wiping away every tear in intimacy god is there god is the temple the city had no need of the sun no need of the moon there's no need for light bearers anymore right the sun is a light bearer the moon reflecting the light of the sun no need of that because the glory of god is the light and the lamb is the light thereof and the nations of them which are saved will walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there will be no night there. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Verse 26. And there will in no wise enter in anything that defiles, nothing that works abomination, or that makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Luke 10, 20. Wow, it's getting humid. You can tell summertime is here. Went from being wintertime to like, now we need our air conditioner. Anyway, chapter 22, and let's wrap this up. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life. Look at this now. We see streets made of gold. We see gates of pearls. We see the names of the children of Israel, sinners saved by grace in the gates. We see the names of the apostles in the foundation. Now we see this pure river of the water of life. He says, clear as crystal. Can we even imagine this proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the lamb in the midst of the street of it? And on either side of this river, there was the tree of life. Look at how revelation is paradise restored in Genesis. We see paradise lost in the garden of Eden. Now, because of the work of the lamb, we see paradise restored. Now do you see why it says in revelation 15 verse three, we will just be singing the song of the lamb. This is all due to the work of christ the song of the lamb we will praise him forever for the work he's done and while by god's spirit we get it now we grasp what he has done for us as sinners to make us righteous and to prepare this place for us but when we're there we're going to get it if any of you feel now well i'm not much of a worshiper and that's your flesh talking well i really don't raise my hands much that's your flesh talking uh, I, i'm just not really the uh, demonstrative type that's all your flesh talking we can't even imagine being set free from this flesh and just in in god's spirit totally just rocking out and seeing jesus as he is and worshiping him forever and it says in ephesians even in the ages to come he will still be showing us his grace so we see the water of life, the river of life coming out of the throne. And it says the tree of life is right there bearing all manner of fruits and yields her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. Wow. It says just the leaves alone bring healing. Look, let's wrap this up. But you are now on your own journey to read through this. Please do read it. Get Henry Morris's book, The Revelation Record, where he gets into all the numbers of what I was unpacking, okay? This is what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, why don't we take a little break? We're going to do hell on Monday. Tomorrow, don't miss it. I'm going to share 20 verses. We're going to do one verse a minute. My daughter's going to sit there and just be like, next. I'm going to jump in next. 20.